But before we turn to the panel, we're truly honored to have with us Representative Jim Sensenbrenner, who's been one of the most vocal and important voices in the United States House of Representatives with regard to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and current proposals for its reform. Um, Congressman Sensenbrenner represents the 5th Congressional District of Wisconsin, which includes Milwaukee, Dodge, and Waukesha County, and all of Washington and Jefferson counties. He was born in Chicago and later moved to Wisconsin with his family. He graduated from the Milwaukee Country Day School and did his undergraduate work at Stanford, where he majored in political science. He then earned his law degree at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1968. After serving 10 years in the Wisconsin State Legislature, he ran for United States House seat and was elected in November 1978. And he's been reelected since then. Uh, his current committee assignments include the service on the Committee on Science and Technology the committee on, and the Committee on the Judiciary. He's chair of the Crime, Terrorism, Homeland Security, and Oversight Subcommittee. He's also a member of the Subcommittee on Courts, Intellectual Property, and the Internet, and the Subcommittees on Environment and Oversight. He's the former chair of the Judiciary Committee and a long-serving committee member. He's established a strong record on crime, on intellectual property, and on constitutional issues. Congressman Sensenbrenner also served as chair of the House Committee on Science, where he solidified his reputation as an independent leader on science issues as well as oversight. Throughout his public life, Congressman Sensenbrenner has been on the forefront of efforts to preserve the sanctity of life, eliminate wasteful government spending, and protect the interests of American taxpayers. He's regularly been cited by the National Taxpayers Union as one of the most fiscally responsible House members and is well known for completing his financial disclosure forms down to the penny. And I have to say, anybody who's ever completed a financial disclosure form <laughs> really knows that that's an extraordinary achievement. Um, he's proud of all of the legislative achievements that have helped improve the lives of many during his tenure in Congress. Shortly after the attacks on September 11th, he introduced the Patriot Act in the House as a method to help keep America safe by enhancing the tools our law enforcement officials could use to thwart another terrorist attack. And he was proud to watch President Bush sign the act into law. He was instrumental in the passing of the Child Abduction Prevention Act, which President Bush signed into law in 2003. This law enhanced the Amber Alert System, strengthened penalties against kidnappers, and aids law enforcement in protecting children. He's also introduced the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act. This act, which is now law, expanded coverage of the National Sex Offender Registry mandates the collection of DNA from sex offenders and forces states to comply with strict requirements to keep the information of sex offenders current. Uh, to ensure that the gains made by minorities during the Civil Rights Movement were not jeopardized, he introduced legislation to extend the Voting Rights Act for 25 years, which was later signed into law. He's a major voice on the issues that we're thinking about today, and it really is a great honor to present to you Congressman Sensenbrenner. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dean, and it certainly is a pleasure to be here today to talk about an issue that I think is really on the front burner, particularly <coughs> uh, in light of all of the revelations that have come out about what the NSA has been doing uh, in the last several months. Uh, let me say that once I am done with this issue, my next project is to try to constitutionalize those parts of the Voting Rights Act uh, that were struck down by the Supreme Court at the end of its term last June, but because the Voting Rights Act, I think, is the one that has been the most effective of all of the important civil rights laws that were passed during the 50s and the 60s and have been brought up to date since then. Uh, so even though I'm not a full committee chair, uh, I am keeping my hands in the pie and uh, attempting to deal with issues that I think are important, not only to the security and safety of this country, but uh, to improving the quality of life for all of the people in the United States of America. I would like to thank Georgetown Law for inviting me here today. Following September 11th, as chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, I was the primary author of the USA Patriot Act. Our goal was to ensure that our intelligence community have the proper tools to combat terror in the post-9-11 world. 
I stand by the original intent of the law, but it has been misinterpreted by both the Bush and Obama administrations. Congressional oversight has also fallen short, and the balance between civil liberties and national security, which we felt we had struck, has been tainted. Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Patrick Leahy, whom I understand uh, spoke at the first one of these sessions, and I have introduced the USA Freedom Act to rein in the abuse and to put an end to spying on innocent Americans while maintaining the necessary tools to enhance and ensure our security. The Patriot Act had 17 provisions. I insisted that all 17 be sunset so that they would expire automatically if they were not reauthorized. After having hearings on each of these 17 uh, provisions in 2005, Congress determined that 14 of the provisions were non-controversial and made them permanent law. The remaining provisions sunset in 2015 and will expire if they are not reauthorized. One of those provisions is Section 215, the so-called business records provision. Section 215 allows the government to apply to the FISA court or FISC for an order to obtain tangible things if they are relevant to an authorized investigation into international terrorism. The administration has used this provision to justify the bulk collection of records of innocent Americans. The administration argues that a request for every phone record is relevant because the universe of every call undoubtedly contains relevant information. In her original decision authorizing bulk collection, the Fisk judge wrote, quote, analysts know that terrorist emails are located somewhere in the billions of data bits, but they cannot know ahead of time is exactly where, unquote. We recently used that the administration has used similar logic to justify the collection of records relating to every financial transfer that Americans make. The government collects and stores these records and then assesses them based on criteria it established with the FISC, a standard adopted in secret and unrelated to anything debated or voted on by the Congress. And I will repeat that, a standard that is, which was adopted in secret and unrelated to anything that was debated or voted on by Congress. The administration's argument is even a reasonable reading of Section 215. If everything is relevant, then the term relevant ceases to have any legal significance. If Congress intended to allow bulk collection, it would have authorized bulk collection. Instead, we attempted to set limits on what the government could obtain. The administration's approach also subverts congressional intent because the FISC has abrogated its responsibility to determine whether the administration is entitled to access records to the extent that it has authorized them. The court was meant to be a neutral arbiter that determined whether collection was lawful. Instead, the administration collects everything and then decides for itself whether it has the authority to access these records. Exacerbating these violations is the fact that Fisk changed the law in secret. We talk a lot about striking the proper balance between civil liberties and national security, but without transparency, there is no balance. The legal standard devolves to nothing more than trust us, and that's trust us, but you don't have the tools to verify. Senator Leahy and I proposed the Freedom Act not only because the intelligence community has lost our trust, but because we believe that the American people are custodians of their government and have a fundamental right to know what is being done in their name. Title I of the Freedom Act directly addresses the business records reforms, ending dragnet collection under Section 215. Title I raises the standard the government must meet to obtain a court order for tangible things and ensures that the records the government obtains are in fact relevant to the government's investigation. Titles II and V adopt a uniform standard for federal collection by applying the heightened standard to pen register and trap and trace devices and to national security letters. 
Taken together, these provisions will force a fundamental shift in how the intelligence community collect data. Rather than allowing the government to collect everything and then to determine what they need, the Freedom Act requires them to show a need for the records before they obtain them. Not only will this protect civil liberties and uh, restore trust in the intelligence community, the changes will focus national security professionals on actual threats. The administration has never made the case that it needs bulk collection programs to keep us safe. Intelligence professionals should pursue actual leads, not dig through haystacks of our private data. Section 702 of FISA allows the government to wiretap foreigners outside the United States without a court order. Title III of the Freedom Act will close the MSA's backdoor access to Americans' communications by requiring the government to obtain a warrant before searching Americans' communications inadvertently obtained under Section 02, 702. Title III also strengthens prohibitions on reverse targeting to ensure the administration does not target foreigners as a pretext for collecting data on Americans who make calls internationally. As we have all seen, tighter standards are meaningless without better oversight. So the Freedom Act also addresses the origins of the problem. The FISC currently operates entirely ex parte, ruling in secret, after hearing only from proponents of the request. Our judicial system is based on an adversarial model, and the Freedom Act brings this safeguard to the FISC by creating the Office of Special Advocate. The Special Advocate is charged with protecting individual rights and civil liberties and ensures that judges on the FISC benefit from opposing viewpoints. Title III also ends secret laws by requiring publications of FISC decision that contain a significant construction or interpretation of law to the greatest extent possible. Title VI helps ensure companies who work with the government are protected. Private companies are currently barred from disclosing basic information about the request for information and assistance they receive from the government. With the support of many of the tech giants, the Freedom Act increases transparency by giving internet and telecom companies the ability to publicly disclose the number of FISC orders and national security letters received, as well as how many orders were complied with. It also will allow the companies to divulge how many users or accounts on whom information was demanded under FISC orders and national security letters. In a joint letter, Microsoft, Apple, Yahoo, Facebook, AOL, Google, and LinkedIn wrote, quote, transparency is a critical first step to an informed public debate, but it is clear that more needs to be done. Our companies believe that government surveillance practices should also be reformed uh, to include substantial enhancement of privacy protections and appropriate oversight and accountability mechanisms for those programs. On October 31st, the Senate Intelligence Committee voted for the first time in our country's history to allow unrestrained spying on Americans. The committee created to collect oversight on these programs has abdicated leadership and responsibility. But Senator Leahy and I are committed to a different approach. With over 100 co-sponsors in the House and Senate covering the political spectrum, I am confident that my colleagues will work pragmatically to continue towards the balanced approach supported by Americans, businesses, and our friends abroad by passing the USA Freedom Act into law. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to field questions uh, until Professor Donahue gives me the hook. But I would ask that everybody who would ask a question approach the microphone so all of us can hear you. And at the beginning, please state your name. And if you do have any type of professional affiliation, please state that also. Who'd like to be first? Thank you.
My name is John Eliff. Uh, I'm retired. Uh, I have worked with uh, some members of the panel, but I was on the staff of the Church Committee, on the staff of the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, when FISA was passed, and on the staff of Senator Leahy as a detailee from the intelligence community when the USA Patriot Act was passed and, Senate, uh, and Section 215 was negotiated. And I had a direct role in negotiating the uh, changes in the administration's original proposal for Section 215. Uh, I recall particularly uh, uh, <laughs> sitting down opposite the FBI general counsel and saying, we have to have a court order, we have to have a relevant standard, and it can't just be relevant to all foreign intelligence. It, for US persons, it has to be relevant to terrorism and counterintelligence. Uh, and you were right. Now, uh, the question I have for you is how you answer the administration's argument that in the reenactment of the Patriot Act, by providing to the congressman in secret the information necessary to understand that there was now a different intent for Section 215, uh, that uh, uh, how that comports with your understanding of how the legislative process should produce legitimate legislative history well, and legitimate action by the Congress that the courts should acknowledge as a congressional action uh, uh, of le uh, that uh, expresses legislative intent. Well, uh, you know, first let me say that the original Patriot Act did not include a relevant standard. Uh, there was a request when the Patriot Act was reauthorized in 2005 and 2006 to include a relevant standard in there. Now, I, I, I think uh, practically everybody in this room, with maybe a few notable exceptions, would say that inserting the word relevance uh, uh, into a sentence that did not contain it before was limiting, meaning it restricted it rather than expanding it. And the administration, after relevance was put in, went to the FISA court and basically turned the logical meaning of the word relevance on its head, uh, meaning it flipped the coin over and rather than limiting it, it, it was expanding. Now, let me say that I was not party to any of this information that was, was given. Uh, I have uh, limited my participation in secret briefings. And the reason I have done that, and I've been in Congress a long time as Senator Leahy has been as well, is usually uh, in these classified briefings we find out stuff that was in either the Washington Post or the New York Times in the, the previous days. Um, and uh, this is an, it was an attempt by the intelligence community basically to shut us up uh, as members of Congress because if we uh, disclosed uh, that information, which was already in the public record, it was in a publicly available newspaper, uh, we could be prosecuted for breaking our oath of secrecy uh, uh, and committing a felony. And I'm not going to get myself involved in that. Uh, early in my career, I was shut up on, on something, and uh, uh, I've gotten to the fool me twice, shame on, on me uh, type of thing. What I can say, however, is that when I was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, uh, Mr. Conyers, who was my ranking member and successor as chairman, and I sent uh, twice a year oversight letters uh, to the Justice Department. Uh, if they were not responsive, we acted like crabby professors and say, you got an incomplete and go and try it again to be responsive to our questions. And we then put up the non-classified part of the answers on the committee's website jointly. This was bipartisanship at work, period. Uh, after I left, uh, the vigorous oversight ceased, and it ended up that the two intelligence committees uh, ended up uh, being cheerleaders for what uh, the Justice Department and the NSA wanted, rather than providing the oversight that was necessary. And now we are paying the price as a country for it, and we're going to have to change the law to stop this from happening again. So I, I hope that answers your question, and you won't I, be a crabby professor to me. I just want to add to that today is a particularly appropriate day yeah. to be exploring uh, how we have achieved uh, President Lincoln's objective of government of the people, by the people, and for the people. 
Well, uh, I thank you for that. I think the more appropriate day comes when there is a decision by the leadership of both houses to give Pat Leahy and me an up or down vote uh, on the Freedom Act. And I'll be willing to bet you that if we get that, we'll win. Thanks for being here with us today, sir. Uh, I'm Andrew Barine. I'm an attorney here in Washington, D.C., uh, and I'm a, a council member with the Truman National Security Project. Um, I'm curious if you could speak to the Najibullah Zazi case. And uh, you, you mentioned that there weren't evidence, uh, that there weren't cases where uh, 215 and 702 bulk collection or use of bulk data was actually uh, preventing terrorism. But I think Najibullah Zazi might be one that has come to public light. Uh, where clearly those authorities are stopping terrorist acts. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that, and how does the Freedom Act preserve that type of collection and analysis? Well, Najibul Azazi uh, obviously was a target. And uh, there could have been a 215 order uh, under the Freedom Act and under the congressional intent that we originally thought uh, that the Patriot Act had. Uh, so the answer to the question is, uh, yeah, there is the legal authority to do that. Now, uh, the only uh, real uh, uh, person who was identified by bulk collection, according to public testimony, was Azazi. And, as, and I may be wrong, but my recollection tells me uh, that he was convicted not of conspiracy for terrorism, but some type of a financial crime uh, when he was actually prosecuted. And, uh, uh, you know, the thing is, is uh, there, if that is the case, you know, I get a little bit worried about it because uh, then uh, uh, the Patriot Act, uh, as it is currently interpreted, uh, and Section 02, uh, can be used to prosecute people uh, who have no relationship to any type of international terrorism because the megadata that uh, uh, is uh, uh, in those records can be used to prosecute people for financial crimes that have no relationship whatsoever to terrorism. I'm sorry, just real quick on a follow-up on that, but I think uh, history has shown in the last 12 years that the prosecutions to disrupt terrorist plots frequently involve things like immigration violations, uh, other non-terrorism related offenses. I mean, they don't fall all under material su support or Title 18. So um, I guess how does, how does the valuable well, collection get preserved under the Freedom Act when, you know, not all the classified cases are going to come to light and the American public won't get to know each of the disrupted plots. But we know that it does work and it does effectively um, help aid in the disruption and prosecution of well, cases. You know, I, my, my answer to that is that there are trillions of records of innocent Americans uh, that are being scooped up. Now, if you want to go entirely on the side of national security, yeah, then let the NSA continue to do what it's doing and let the FISA court continue to do what it's doing as well. Uh, uh, I'm trying to strike a balance between national security and the protection of civil liberties, which is, I think, one of the reasons which has made our country unique and has allowed it to survive for over 200 years uh, on it. And uh, again, I am trying to strike a balance. I thought that balance was struck with the Patriot Act. Let me say the Patriot Act never would have passed uh, in uh, September and October of 2001 uh, had there been any inclination at all that would have authorized bulk collections. And I'm saying that as one who was intimately involved in the negotiations and that if it was authorized bulk collections, it would have been shot down by an overwhelming vote or never can't come up for a vote because the votes weren't there for it. Next question. We have time for one more. Yes, please. Okay. Good morning, my name is Sanne Overvelde Slagman. I'm a student of uh, Amsterdam University, law student. And I was wondering if you see any possibilities to um, amend Section 702 to maybe better protect European citizens and also protect American business and through this. Well, um, the bill does se amend Section 702. 
Uh, in terms of the protection of European citizens, uh, the weekend before last, my chief of staff, Bart Forsyth, and I went to Brussels. And we had extensive conversations with members of the European Parliament. I did testify before a committee of the European Parliament, and uh, I also uh, had a dinner that was sponsored by the Transatlantic Partnership Network that had both MEPs as well as Brussels representatives of, of U.S. businesses. Uh, I was accused of giving a vague answer in response to that question that you posed that repeatedly came up. And my answer is, is that uh, uh, European Commission member Redding is due to have a negotiation with Attorney General Holder this coming weekend. And uh, uh, how we proceed on that particular issue, I think, depends upon the, the outcome of those negotiations. What I will say is without an amendment uh, to either or both uh, 215 and 702, U.S. businesses, starting with the tech companies and the telecom companies, are going to be losing an awful lot of business <laughs> in Europe. And at that dinner, I heard about this again and again and again uh, from different representatives. Now, uh, one of America's uh, most popular exports uh, is the information technology that has been applied to telecommunications. And it certainly does uh, significantly reduce the, uh, the U.S. balance of payments deficits and that's why in my opinion this has this issue has to be resolved if we want to protect international trade and where we have been doing the best as Americans in Europe so uh, I await to hear from both the Attorney General and the Commissioner and I want to hear from both of them uh, so I don't get spun into the wrong direction. And I, uh, that's why, I, as a lawyer, I do believe in adversarial proceedings uh, rather than hearing a learned presentation on one side and coming to a better learned conclusion. That's usually where trouble starts. Okay, I'm looking forward to Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, th th there is one I'm going to just abuse for a moment, the privilege uh, of, of moderator here. Yesterday, the documents that were released uh, showed that the email metadata collection program was being conducted under the pen register and trap and trace provisions of the mm -hmm. USA Patriot Act. Uh, how does the bill that you and Senator Leahy have sponsored address uh, that type of uh, metadata collection? Uh, it, in, uh, it increases the standards for metadata collection through trap and trace and pen register as well as the use of national security uh, uh, letters uh, to the same standard that would be required to get a FISA order uh, under uh, Section 215. Uh, what I can say is that when Mr. Conyers and I were jointly doing the oversight, uh, uh, the testimony was that 215 was very sparingly used during the period of 2001 through 2006, but uh, the national security letter requests uh, uh, were rolling off the Xerox machine at breakneck speed. And uh, it is Senator Leahy's hope and mine uh, that if we fix 215 and 702, uh, they don't use the other types of uh, provisions in the Patriot Act uh, to do what we thought we were stopping uh, with the amendments to the other laws. Great. Thank you. Uh, I hope that you will join me in thanking Representative Sensenbrenner Thank for you. taking time to be here today. Thank you. I, I, I doubt that. Yeah. <laughs> Take care. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.